Today is uh, 9 June 2009. We are at the Isaac C. Griswold Public Library in Whitehall, New York. My name is Wayne Clark. I'm with the State uh, Military Museum. Uh, and we are interviewing a Mr. Cataret mm -hmm. this morning. Sir, for the record, would you please state your full name and your date and place of birth, please? Yes, yeah, Wendell Philip Cataret. I was born in Worcester, Massachusetts, August 3rd, 1925. And did you attend school there? Yes, I did. And did you graduate from high school? No, but I got a GED after the war. Okay. <laughs> and uh, do you remember where you were when you heard about the attack on Pearl Harbor? Yes, I'd uh, <clears throat> not gone to the movie on December 7th with my cousin. And uh, we'd gone to the city of Worcester and we were, we were walking back. And instead of taking a bus, we wanted to save a dime for ice cream. We got in an ice cream store and uh, we heard a bunch of men talking. And one of them said they'll be taking kids like this pretty soon. We were 16 years old. Mm -hmm. We didn't know what he was talking about, but in those days you didn't talk to an adult, I mean, unless you were spoken to. So mm -hmm. we left and we went home to his house, my cousin's house, and my uncle Lucian said, uh, asked, he said, have you heard the news? And we said, what news? And he said, the Japanese have bombed Pearl Harbor. And we said, what's Pearl Harbor? <laughs> because nobody knew mm -hmm. much about it in those days. Yeah. And then he said, it's in the, uh, it's in Hawaii. So and then the next morning in school, high school, uh, I was in South High School, then they called us down. Uh, everybody had to go to the auditorium and they had a radio on a little table and the principal was behind their superintendent. <clears throat> and then they uh, put on Roosevelt's, President Roosevelt's speech declaring war on Japan. Mm -hmm. I remember at the time we were, you have to remember the way a kid thought in those days. We were raised on cowboy movies, so you're always looking forward to going to war and becoming a, a hero. You later find out you wish the war had ended. But anyway, uh, uh, that night or the next night we were riding around with two of my friends and my buddy had his brother's 37 Chevy we were riding around and we were complaining and moaning because the war would be over in six weeks and we were too young to get involved in the war and we were born too late, we said. Never realized it was going to last four years. Mm -hmm. So you dropped out of school to go into the service? No, I went to, I dropped out of school to make some money. Okay. And I worked at Ball and Chain and that, that way I made a pretty good uh, wage for that day. Mm -hmm. And then uh, on August 2nd I went to Springfield, Massachusetts and volunteered. Now you were, how old were you at that time when you volunteered? 17. And you volunteered for the Army? Mm -hmm. Why did you pick the Army? I wanted to go in tanks. Okay. All right. Had you had any family members that were in the service or had been in? No, my father had been in the National Guard, Vermont National Guard, okay. way years ago, but <clears throat> nobody else, no. And uh, whereabouts did they send you for your basic training? I went to Fort McClellan, Alabama, basic training infantry, 17 weeks course. Mm -hmm. Was that your first time away from home for an extended period of time? Oh yeah, definitely. What was that like for you? Oh, I was looking forward to it. Uh, we left uh, <clears throat> Fort Devens on a troop train and we were heading south and uh, to have to digress a bit. When I joined the Army, before uh, I'd taken the physical, but they hadn't said anything to us yet. They said we we're going to be sworn in later. Mm -hmm. And we're all standing there. I can't remember how many there were, but it was quite a few guys. What I didn't realize is they were taking the same test for the Army, the Navy, and the Marine Corps. And a Sergeant Marine Corps came by and he said, uh, Hey, I talked to you about joining the Marine Corps, didn't I? I said, No, no, I. I said, no, sir, which I didn't, you know, sir, sergeant, but I didn't know better. And I said, no, sir, uh, I'm, I'm going in the Army. He said, no, you want to go in the Marine Corps, don't you? I realized then they were stealing each other's recruits before they'd been sworn in. Uh -huh. And I said, no, sir, I said, I'm going in the Army. I want to be in the tanks. 
So when they swore me in, uh, an army officer did later on, uh, he told me because I was a volunteer, I had my pick of my service, of the service, which I knew. And mm -hmm. so I said, yes, sir, I want to go in the tanks, so, armored division. So when we left Fort Evans, we were only there a week. Went to Fort Devons, Massachusetts, and we are on our way going south. We stopped one stop that was at uh, uh, where the gold is, Fort... Uh, oh, Fort Knox, Kentucky. Fort Knox, Kentucky. That's, that's armor division. Mm -hmm. So the sergeant comes through the railroad cars calling out names. He didn't call my name. He started to leave the car. I yelled, hey, sergeant, he didn't call my name. He said, if I didn't call your name, you're not going here. I said, yeah, but I volunteered. I, I got my pick of the services, and everybody in the car yelled, you'll be sorry. <laughs> and then we loaded, took off again, and the next time we pulled in was at Fort McClellan, and it was basic training infantry. Mm -hmm. And as I said, a 17-week course. And then in the 10th week of the course, they asked for volunteers for the paratroopers, and uh, there were eight of us that uh, volunteered, and we took the test, physical, mm -hmm. and we didn't hear anything more, so we figured we'd fail because it was pretty rugged physical. And then the uh, the last week, our 17th week, uh, we had bought our tickets home. In those days, what they used was they called it en route furlough. I think we had something like 15 days en route furlough. In other words, you could go anywhere you wanted to go, but you had to end up at the end of this 15 days or the 20 days at uh, Fort Meade, Maryland. Mm -hmm. That was a POE, Port of Embarkation, mm -hmm. for Europe. And so I'd bought my ticket along with the others. And then uh, a soldier came in the barracks and he said, uh, you went up at the CO's office. So I went up to the CO's office and as I walked in, I looked and there was the other seven guys sitting there. And of course I knew that they were the volunteers for the paratroopers. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, looks like we're going after all. Well. The sergeant says, the captain will be out pretty soon, he wants to talk to you. Well, you think you get a little bit of praise for volunteering for an outfit that jumps out of airplanes. We didn't get it. He called us cowards. He called us the deserters. He called us that we had abandoned our fellow men. See, there were 200 men in a training unit. Mm -hmm. And he accused us of abandoning them in order to avoid combat. <laughs> No such thing. The Army had asked for volunteers. You can't become a paratrooper unless you're a volunteer. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we kind of were taken aback by that. It was quite an insult he gave us. But uh, the next morning we watched the fellows lined up and they were on their way home. They were going to get on buses and then go to the train station. And the eight of us stayed there. And then they, a couple of days later, they shipped us to Fort Benning. Georgia mm -hmm. for the paratroops. But when we got there, we no more than got to Fort Benning and they told us we had to take a physical. And we said, we've already done that in uh, Fort McClellan. And they said, no, you took an army physical. You didn't take a paratroop physical. So they made us take a physical all over again. <clears throat> and uh, seven of us passed it. One fellow didn't. Mm -hmm. Uh, he was like my, my age. He was 18 years old. We got back to the barracks and uh, he was feeling terrible. He was he was actually crying and uh, they had told him they was going to be put in an infantry outfit there at uh, Fort Benning, Georgia. Well, he was, and he felt terrible because the others they'd trained with, all of us had trained mm -hmm. up at Fort McClellan. They were on their way to Fort Meade, Maryland. And now he's going to be stuck with a bunch of guys he didn't even know. But we had one guy that was kind of like a barracks lawyer. He said, if you're smart, he said, what you'll do is you'll sneak out of camp tonight and get on the train and go to Fort Meade, Maryland. And when you report there, tell them that you were uh, told that you didn't pass a physical and you were to go back to your original unit. He said, heck, they'll never send you back to Fort Benning. They, they want you overseas, he said. so." They'll put you with your regular mm -hmm. 200 guys to start it. But I honestly don't know if he did it or not. I, I know that uh, he was kind of timid about it, but uh, mm -hmm. feeling bad. But the rest of the seven of us, we went through the parachute training. And how was that parachute training? 
was four weeks. Uh, a week was uh, first week, called A, B, C, and D. First week was physical ed. You did an awful lot of running, push-ups, everything under the sun, nine of, of uh, physical ed. As B stage, uh, you jumped out of the 34-foot tower. What they do, you go, you go up this tower and it's 34 feet off the ground. You put on a harness, just all you got is a harness, and there's a, there's a cable from there to a cable running from there to a, uh, like a sand pit or a mm -hmm. sawdust pile. And so you stand in the doorway and you have to assume the position that a paratrooper assumes in an airplane. And you, they watch you to make sure you do everything right. And then you, when he slaps you on the fanny, that means you have to jump. And uh, they do that the first man, everybody else would follow. But here, you're doing it individually. Mm -hmm. And he slaps you on the fanny, and then you make your exit. And your exit is, uh, you kick out your right leg as you jump. So you swing to the left, so that you're facing the what would have been the, air, the rear of the airplane. Mm -hmm. And then you duck your head, you clamp your hands like this. And as you fall, your cable catches the other cable, tightens, and then you run down the cable, and you go into the... Sand, it's a sawdust pit. Mm -hmm. And then also uh, a half of the day is you're learning how to pack a parachute. Because for the first five jumps, you have to jump your own parachute that you packed. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and the way you do that is you use a buddy system. It would be like you and I. I would stand on the right side of the, of the long table, and the parachute's laid out on the table. And then you'd be on the left side, and then we roll it according to the instructions. Mm -hmm. Don't ask me how, because I forget it. <laughs> Fifty some odd years or sixty years. Of, uh, obviously, uh, they opened all right. <laughs> oh yeah, but and then uh, then when you uh, when you pack your chute, you pack the reserve chute. It's a smaller one, and then you set them aside. Then you do you jump on that side. And he gets over here. Now you pack his chute, and then you put the then they put the chutes in what they call the uh, uh, packing shed. Uh, but anyway, you, you'll, you don't do it the, that second week, you're just learning how to pack. Uh, then the third week is C stage, and you uh, jump out of 250 foot towers. And again, you put on a harness, and there's a parachute already opened above you, and it's hooked to a big steel ring. Mm -hmm. And then uh, there's usually just lift three up according to the wind. And he'll, uh, when he gives a signal, they pull you up. And of course, you're hanging from an open chute. And they raise you up about 240 feet, about 10 feet short. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you say you're number one. They'll say, number one, drop your paper. You're all given a little piece of paper. So you drop the paper. And then if it floats into the tower, then you don't, you know, they don't release you, because that would be a disaster. They just want to make sure that you leave mm -hmm. safely. And then when he says uh, something about, okay, number one, then you feel the thing go up another 10 feet, and it goes click, and it releases, and now you're floating by the parachute to the ground. And while you're coming down, there's a sergeant on the ground yelling, uh, turn, uh, uh, foot, swing, Swing to the left, swing to the right, stuff like that. Prepare for a landing. you are got to assume the position for a landing. And then you're going to have your knees bent and your feet are going to be together like that. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you slam into the ground. But it's not, you don't really slam like a regular parachute. It's, but you can feel it. Mm -hmm. But it was very pleasant. It was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. And you also, in C stage, you uh, continue learning to pack the parachute. And then you... Uh, you, when you, when they know you've accomplished it, then you do set them aside in the packing shed, and uh, then they give you the weekend off, Saturday, Sunday, you can go to town or something like that, mm -hmm. and then Monday morning you start your jumps. You jump Monday morning, Tuesday morning, Wednesday morning, Thursday morning, and Friday night. And uh, so you had a night jump too. Oh yeah, that's the fifth mm -hmm. and final one. And then you got your parachute wings? Yeah, after it was over with, you uh, 
you're you're giving your it was on a Saturday morning. Mm -hmm. They give you they pin your parachute wings on you, and then you have to go inside and uh, there's a jump roster, and you have to sign that. And it says that you will jump if and when asked. Mm -hmm. And if you don't jump, you're going to get a six months and two thirds court martial. Mm -hmm. All right. So once you completed your jump training, what happened next? Well, I went to radio school, mm -hmm. and uh, I did three weeks of radio school, and then there was, then they would fall with an advanced course of six weeks, but then they told us that uh, we were qualified to go home on furlough. But then they gave us the news that if you don't take it now, we can't guarantee your furlough at the end of the six weeks. Well, I wasn't going to hang around and not get a furlough, mm -hmm. so I opted out of the radio men and I, uh, I went home and uh, I think it was a 20-day furlough. Mm -hmm. And then after your furlough, where did you go next? I came back to uh, Benning mm -hmm. and uh, we had a couple jumps. Uh, we had a, I jumped with a, with a walkie-talkie radio. Mm -hmm. Some guys had to carry a little cage of pigeons. Others uh, carried the, what they called the 511 radio. It was looked like a, a radio box on a big spear. Mm -hmm. And we all joked that we didn't want to get stuck with that thing. We'd get speared in the ground. <laughs> but I had a, a walkie-talkie, easy one. Mm -hmm. And then we had a, a tactical jump, which was the uh, last jump I made there. Other than, and then I also assisted at a jump. Uh, they called us for detail one time. They said, you're going to go out and you're going to pick up gear after these guys jump. That was a early a later class. So we're all standing around there shooting the breeze and we could see the C-47s coming and the sergeant says, everybody, everybody get out of here. He says, you don't want to be on the ground when they come out of that airplane because everything's going to come flying down at you. So we went over by the edge of the woods there and, and it was amazing when it come down. We could see uh, helmets coming down, a couple of cases, rifles come f flying loose from the guys. Uh, one, one rifle stuck about halfway into the ground. <laughs> if we'd been standing out there, it could have been bad. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, they put me on a, they were, I forget how many we had, we had about 200 men. And uh, they told us we were going to Europe again, to Europe, and oh, this was of course for the paratroops. But I was put on a guard duty, where I think there were four of us. We were put on light guard duty, in other words, uh, not German prisoners of war, but Americans that have uh, AWOL and stuff like that, mm -hmm. or minor desertion. And so there was a uh, stockade there, and we just had to guard the stockade. Well, I think it was the first night or the second night, you're on duty for four days. And uh, the first or second night, one of the other fellows we were with come running over to his buddy, which was one of the four of us, and he said, we're moving out tomorrow morning for Fort Meade, Maryland. We're leaving for Europe. He said, well, what about us? He says, I don't think you're going. So this fellow said, well, hold my rifle. He said, I don't go back and talk to the captain. So he ran back to see the captain, and he pled his case. The captain says, no, you're going to go out. You guys are going to go later. He said, I want to go now. He says, okay, you can go, but tell the other three or, three or four of us to stay there. He said, you're going to be, you're going to, they're going to join us at Fort Meade, Maryland. And so uh, we got back to the barracks the end of the four days, and there were just uh, three or four of us, and they stuck us in another group of men, and it was about a hundred of us. Uh, they went us through an obstacle course, and then uh, we were moving out, to be told that we were going to be loaded on board a train, troop train. We took off from Benning and uh, we headed west, and I think we got near Arkansas or something like that, and then the troop train went north to Chicago. Well, we figured we were going to Europe, because this is where everybody was going. Mm -hmm. So we got to Chicago and they let us out to go to a USO tour that was there, a no USO team, I should say. Uh, we went to that, got back on the train, and the train moved out that night. We woke up in the morning and 
somebody says, where the heck are we? And about that time, later on in the day, somebody saw a sign for St. Louis. He says, St. Louis, hell, we ain't going to Europe, we're going to the Pacific. And a sergeant with us, there was a one or two sergeants and a, with, a, with an officer. And they laughed, and they, because they knew all along. They said, yeah, you're going to the Pacific. You're going to join the 503rd Parachute Regiment. So we kept on going across country till we got to uh, Fort Ord, California. Mm -hmm. We were there one week, and then uh, we went by bus to Fort uh, Camp Stoneman, which is a POE for Pacific. And we were there about uh, three weeks. And uh, there were a hundred of us, uh -huh. as I said. We had, we were there, it just made me think of it. Uh, one late afternoon, in come two MPs with a guy. And he wasn't a paratroop, he was a regular infantry guy. And he put them in with us, and then the, P, the MPs, because you don't question them. And they left, and then we all ganged around these guys. And this guy said, what happened? He says, oh, he said, uh, you're given a three-day furlough. He said, three, I mean, an overnight pass, excuse me, not three days. I can't remember for sure. Anyway, to go to Frisco. He said, so I didn't go to Frisco. He says, I went home to Michigan or Minnesota. And he deserted. And they uh, picked him up there. Mm -hmm. And they brought him back. And then they stuck him in with us. Because I guess they, <laughs> they figured he'd mind or something. And uh, later on, a buddy of mine, uh, Thomas Carroll from Portland, Oregon, he and I were close buddies, he got a... Uh, that passed into Frisco. His aunt lived there, so he's going to go see her. And then he came back, and then my turn came. And uh, I didn't, I had nothing to go to Frisco for that I was interested in. So I asked him if he wanted to go in my place to go back and see his aunt. He said, sure, so he went. And uh, believe it or not, this guy that was a deserter, he was given a three-day pass. <laughs> he didn't show up. <laughs> He took off again. Uh -huh. We never did see him. So uh, then later on, they put us on a ship, uh, General J.R. Brooks, a big passenger ship. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were on that for 21 days until we got to uh, Oro Bay, New Guinea. And we, the 503rd wasn't there. They just put us mm -hmm. there. And then uh, Shortly after we got there, or I shouldn't say shortly, maybe a couple of months, we had certain small duties to do. Now, now, what uh, month and year was that? I went overseas in April of 44. Okay. And uh, they get, we took us to a, a kind of a wild river to swim in. I never knew it at that time, but they, they were crocodiles in that country. <laughs> Thank God I didn't know it. I'd been scared. Uh, then one time they put us on detail to unload coffins, army mm -hmm. coffins. And uh, we saw a body brought in that they uh, did an autopsy on, the most horrible thing I've ever seen in my life. But I watched that. He died from scrub typhus. Was it an American? Oh, yeah, one of our, one of the soldiers. Mm -hmm. Not my outfit, my group, but he was just a guy there. And, yeah. Bay. Scrub typhus was a, uh, it comes from a tick. And it's like the Rocky Mountain fever in a way, only it's more mm -hmm. deadly. Uh, the tick gets on you. It, they'll get off the kunai rats and uh, it runs in the kunai grass. And if you're walking through this high grass, they'll stick on your leg. And then, of course, then they eat their way inside. You don't feel them. Mm -hmm. If you don't see them, if you see them, then you take a cigarette and you put it on them and burn them and they kills them and mm -hmm. fall off. But if it gets inside you, uh, then you build up a tremendous fever. And if you live, well, if you don't, <laughs> you die. But uh, those that do like one fellow, I knew Keller from Chicago, he had it. And he was 180 pounds, he, I think he said. He got out, he was only around 140 pounds. Oh. So, you know, people, you, 
in the Pacific, we had all kinds of diseases, as you mm -hmm. know, but uh, you hear so much about malaria. I, I never remember anybody fearing malaria. We feared scrub typhus. Mm -hmm. We feared elephantiasis. There were all kinds of diseases down there that were bad. Mm -hmm. And it was all jungle living, you know, it was uh, no civilization. You didn't buy, you didn't go to a PX to buy anything. You issued cigarettes, you issued mm -hmm. food, uh, you issued candy. What about things like snakes and scorpions? Oh yeah, they were there, mm -hmm. all over the place. I saw a few. When one tent we're in, but this was later on in Nile and for there was a a stump in the middle of our tent, and the guys mm -hmm. decided to to uh, cut it, you know, dig it out. And they were digging it out, and out come this snake. And it was poisonous. Of course, they hit it with an entrenching tool and cut Killed its it. head off. Hmm. But uh, there was <laughs> there was a lot of dis you know. Today I look at it. In those days, when we after the war, we used to get back. When, did you? We got back with everybody. Would most of the guys are from Europe, and you'd be talking, and we env envied them because they were in civilization, and they fought with a civilized en enemy, yeah. more or less. We didn't in the Pacific. You fought the ja Japanese, and they weren't civilized in their actions. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had one advantage that we didn't realize at the time, but. I was overseas almost two years, and there wasn't a day that you couldn't swim. You were always somewhere near the equator. So it was uh, it was an advantage. I, I wouldn't have wanted to be like the other paratroopers in Europe, 101st Airborne, were in the Battle of the Bulge, and they were in two-foot snow and mm -hmm. losing their toes and stuff like that. Now, now did your unit jump at all in the My Pacific? Unit, yeah, we joined them in August of 44. Mm -hmm. And I was put in Company B. My, my, as they ran us down, they put so many in each company. And another fellow myself were put in Company B. Uh, I forgot your question. What'd you say? Uh, I asked if, if you jumped at all. Oh, no. The they did. They jumped on, uh, on uh, Markham Valley, New Guinea, mm -hmm. the old timers. And then they jumped on Noonfor with the island which I joined them. But they jumped before our hunter joined them. Now remember another thing in the in the uh, Pacific, you don't have many fields to jump in. Yeah. Most everything is is jungle. <clears throat> the uh, but then when we were on Noom for, and uh, they tell us we had to uh, do a practice jump, and they're going to jump the regiment in, in a series of so many days, and they and they took it right down to the level squad level. And uh, <clears throat> half the guys jumped one day, and the other guys were to jump the next day. So we jumped on this one particular day and uh, made our jump, and it was a little dinky field, and we landed it okay. And we came back, and uh, when I got back to the tent, my sergeant, Mike Matevich, who's a hell of a nice guy, Mike says, uh, one of them said, uh, your friend pulled sick leave, he said. Uh, we need one volunteer, and you're it. <laughs> so, because I was the newest guy, they volunteered me, so I mm -hmm. had to jump two days in a row. Now you guys had to jump to get your jump pay, right? Oh yeah, if mm -hmm. you could, yeah. But on that particular jump was uh, uh, they we we loaded up when you're in full combat gear. They took us to the airfield, but it was a noon time. Of course, they'd been jumping all day long. Mm -hmm. Other out parts of the outfit. We get to the field, we're fully loaded with stuff, so we all laid down because it's uncomfortable to stand up with all your chutes on and every gear, rifle, and everything. And we're waiting for the airplane. But what we didn't know was that in the morning, the first guys to jump, they missed the field by a long way because there was quite a wind blowing. It was, it was passable as far as jumping, but it was, you mm -hmm. know, you had to jump properly, you had to jump to the side. So from then on, the airplanes went to the right of the field, so the wind would drift the guys over to the field, and they'd land in it. So they did that all the way till noontime. When well, it came our turn, and we're laying there, and then the crew came out for the C-47, and they loaded us aboard. Well, what we didn't know, because we never knew about the wind to begin with, was the wind stopped. So we took off. The pilot, of course, wasn't probably wasn't told about it. 
So as we flew along, we approached the field. We had to go through the motion of stand up, hook up, and all that. Mm -hmm. And then they, when they slapped the first guy in the fanning, of course, you all follow. You, you jump in a stick of 12 people. And uh, as I want to come out, the first thing you do when your shoot opens is you check for your canopy to make sure your shoot is okay, you, that you don't need your reserve. And I looked down about that time, I heard somebody yell, where the hell's the field? And I looked down below me and all there was was jungle. And I started looking around, I could see nothing but jungle. You don't want to land that stuff. No. And I looked way out there and there's this postage stamp. And that's the field. So the minute I saw it, I went into a forward slip. You grab your two front risers, put them together, and you climb them. You can only climb so far. And what it does to the chute, it spills, it collapses the front of the chute. You can't collapse the chute, mm -hmm. but it just collapses part of it. And when it does that, you go in that direction. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, you go faster. So uh, I heard a couple of the other guys say, hell, I ain't going to go for it. We'll never make it. They ended up in the jungle. But uh, we came down, and then I thought how lucky I was doing. I was coming down towards the thing. But after about 100 feet off the ground, you got to release your chute because you slip because you can't uh, land at that speed. It would be yeah. dangerous. And then I look, and of course, another piece of bad luck. Here's the jungle below me. And I'm about 20 feet away from the field, drifting in that way. And there's a dead tree sticking out right in front of me. And I'm going right into the tree. Well, now you run into another problem. When you land, uh, as I told you, you land with your feet together and your knees slightly bent. So that it's like a shock absorber. Mm -hmm. But if you hit a tree, you don't want to land like that. If you should go land like this on a tree, and you straddle a tree, bingo, you're going to be singing soprano for the rest of your life. And that's going to be dangerous. Mm -hmm. So what you do is you cross your legs. Mm -hmm. Now there's another problem. If you miss the tree and you hit the ground, and your legs crossed, there goes a leg snapped. Mm -hmm. Then another one is your eyes and your throat. So when you go on a tree, you put your trot to, to go like this. You close your eyes, put your head down, and you protect your neck and you protect your eyes. Mm -hmm. So I did that because I knew I was going to hit that tree. And as I passed over the top of the tree, I could feel them, these small limbs busting off my butt as I crashed over the top of it. And I could hear the wood above me as I kept on going down and I come to a stop. And when I come to a stop, I was about this far off the ground. Mm -hmm. And I looked up at my chute and you could see uh, twigs and limbs pierced all the way through it, all over the place. So I uh, went like this a couple of times to pull it down further and uh, so I could just touch my tiptoes and unhook my chute and mm -hmm. walked about 10 feet, out in the, 10 feet out in the field. The other two guys didn't get in until the next day so they had to sleep with the mosquitoes. Oh boy. <laughs> So, um, did you have any direct contact with the Japanese? Not then, no. Uh -huh. uh, shortly after, I went to uh, Min, because uh, the Japanese were all dead on the island. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, we saw the USO troop, Bob Hope, oh. Dorothy Lamour, uh, his comedian, I forget his name now, Jerry oh, Colonna. Uh, Colonna, yeah. Uh, a group like that. Uh, uh, Bob Hope tells a story that uh, he said the only time his life was properly in danger was, he says, I was doing a USO tour in the island of Nome for Dutch New Guinea, and he said there was a report of a Japanese sniper in a tree. Uh, we had heard that too as we were leaving. They, somebody said there was a Jap seen in a tree, but he, I don't think it was a sniper. I think he was just watching the show. Uh -huh. So, Anyway, we load on board ships. And they took us to uh, Philippines. Now, Philippines, uh, Leyte, an island of Leyte, they had already, I don't know which day it was, we got, they invaded October 20th, but we weren't on the invasion. Mm -hmm. We were especially outfit being paratroopers. They put us on uh, duty right by the beach in case it was a counter landing. But we were, I didn't know at the time, we were preparing, we were uh, uh, getting more ammunition and equipment for an invasion of Mindoro. 
But the Japanese landed uh, two airplanes with Japanese paratroopers. They didn't jump. They made, they were, by the way, they were DC-3 or C-47s, but they had got them before the war. Uh -huh. And they come in and, uh, whereas we found later their mission was to land and then go to the airfield and then wreck as many airplanes as they could. I don't think they wrecked any airplanes, but they headed west across the island going to join the other Japanese there. But the Japanese were over almost every day with the uh, aircraft. Mm -hmm. They were kamikaze on the ships at sea, not at sea, but in the port. You know, they're not, they're out there probably 100 yards or so, supply ships. Mm -hmm. And there were, of course, some uh, warships. And uh, they come over and there were, every day just about there was a dogfight. There are planes, uh, Navy airplanes and uh, Japanese airplanes. Mm -hmm. We had one time we were <clears throat> on down by the beach where we'd gone swimming, and uh, we'd heard firing up above us. Uh, Tathlobin is the capital, and that was where most everything was. The action was. We were in a little town called Dulag, which was ten miles south of there. And uh, somebody says, "Look, here comes an airplane. I bet it's Japanese." And uh, a couple of guys ran over to the wood line, but we stood out there looking at it because. We knew they weren't going to be bothering. They're not going to waste bullets on soldiers on the ground. And it came over, and it was Japanese. And he was, oh, I don't know, he was probably about a thousand feet up. You could see the red meatballs mm -hmm. on him. And he went by us, and he turned around and came back again. And about that time, we saw uh, two P-38s come down at him. And the first lead P-38 fired in him. And then, of course, he was going tremendous speed, so he had to veer off. And about that time, the Jap started smoking, and then he turned around like this and dove on a ship. And he hit the ship with his left wing, and of course, there was a huge fire, mm -hmm. an explosion. But the ship was damaged bad, but it was okay. Mm -hmm. But that uh, they did that almost daily, uh, that or tried to do it. A lot of times, they weren't successful. And then we prepared for the invasion of Mindoro. And even though we were paratroopers, we made a water landing. I don't know why. Uh, maybe it was too far, 400 miles up there, mm -hmm. 400 miles back or something. But we came in by water and made our landing there. We ran in no, uh, no opposition. The few Japanese who were on the island took off. And uh, we didn't know it, and we found out later, as uh, we talked at our reunion, we were a diversionary force. We were, the main purpose of to put us on the island of Mindoro was to have the Japanese counter landing on us. And then we were to go into the hills mm -hmm. and fight from there. But meanwhile, MacArthur planned to invade Luzon, which was only 25 miles away from us. And uh, they figured any Japanese that come on in Mindoro would be that much less they'd have to deal with when they invaded Luzon. But uh, we were there for, we, we came in on December 15th. Our, our fleet was, uh, our group was kamikaze one time mm -hmm. on the way up. And then uh, we, we came ashore and we were put right on the beach. We were 1st Battalion and we were on the beach for in case it was a counter landing. 2nd Battalion was put five miles inland town of Mindoro, which is the capital, uh, San, San Jose, and the 3rd Battalion was further inland. And we were there for, oh, from December 15th to December, January 1st. Uh, one night, Sergeant came by and he said, uh, I want you to pass the word there could be a, a landing with the Japanese. You have to be prepared for it. There's Japanese planes, uh, ships coming. I don't know how they got the message, but my job was a runner, was a run along. We were spread out very, very thin. Mm -hmm. And I had to go all the way down through the company and report that uh, be prepared, there may be a bombardment. Then I came back, and then it got dark, and we were all a little uh, wondering what was going on. We thought it was more story than anything else. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we heard a flash, or saw the flash, of a gun out to sea. And a Japanese heavy cruiser and a Japanese destroyer were firing. 
and then when you could hear them as they went overhead, they weren't firing at us. Mm -hmm. They were firing at the airfield, or trying to hit it. But they put all their shells into the San Jose River, which lit up at night, I guess, and must have thrown them off. But when you hear eight inch shells going overhead, it's like a freight train mm -hmm. going through the heavens. And then our uh, P-38s and P-47s took off after them, and you could see, we couldn't see them, but we could hear the machine guns, or see the machine guns coming down and ricocheting off the Jap cruiser. And then uh, they'd each take turns at it. And finally mm -hmm. the Japanese left. They never did make a landing. They never intended to, as we found out later. All they intended was to uh, harass us mm -hmm. and shoot up as many airplanes as they could. So we're there until, uh, uh, that was on December 26th, and on January 1st, New Year's Day of 45, uh, we were washing our clothes in the San Jose River. I call, we called the San Jose River. I don't even know if that was a name, but that's what we called mm -hmm. it, because the capital was up at San Jose. And a sergeant come by and he says, uh, sack up all your gear. He says, we're moving out. We said, hell, all our clothes are wet. He said, don't worry about it. Just the ones, all you need is the ones you want, your rifle and the ammunition. He says, leave your stuff on the river bank. He said, we'll pick them up when we come back he didn't tell us where we were going. And uh, this was just Company B. And we marched down to the uh, beach, and there were two LCIs there. And they loaded us aboard these two LCIs. And after they pulled away from shore, they told us what we were going to do. They said 80 miles up the coast was a Japanese radio shack and a CP giving information to Luzon, and our job was to knock it out, knock out the CP. So we went up 60 miles by water, and then we landed by a burning law, a tree that the Filipino guerrillas had put on fire, mm -hmm. and just burning it, uh, just like embers. And we landed on that site. And then we landed there, they told us we had to unload the LCIs. And uh, we ran men out stand next to each other and we'd load our ammunition and all this food and stuff like that. <clears throat> but I noticed that after we get along, it kept on moving further and further out. Next thing I know, I was up to the ramp of the LCI. And then I finally had to jump on because I was getting up neck deep. So I jumped up on the LCI and the guy that was next to me down here, still in the water, he said, hell, I ought to drown if I stand here. So he pulled away. Well, then we realized the LCI was drifting. Uh -huh. So we said to the sailors, what's, what's the story? And the sailor says, oh, the, uh, a plane had just gone over shortly before that, but at nighttime. I doubt if he even saw us, and I doubt if he's in Japanese. He could have been an American airplane. But the skipper was nervous about it. He said, uh, we're going to pull, he told the sailors, we're going to pull back, and then we're going to make a run at the beach and drown the LCI again. So we waited for a while, and then finally we heard the command from one of the Navy guys. He said, you guys are going to have to swim for it. We said, swim? You know, we had, we had our paratrooper boots on, mm -hmm. halfway laced down, and our <coughs> fatigues on. And uh, so we didn't hesitate. Another fellow came over who he was, another guy, and I, we jumped in to swim to shore. And we were laughing, joking that we were going to drown because our boots were full of water. And we were swimming, you know, we were sluggish, really. Uh, and, but before we left the ramp, we heard a couple of guys say they couldn't swim. And they said they are going to give them life preservers. Well, they gave them the belt preserver. And what they are is they have two CO2 mm -hmm. things. You squeeze it, and it uh, inflates the CO2 in there. And then you float by that till you get to shore. We finally, the two of the other guy myself, we got to shore and we were puffing and laughing. And we were sitting in the water right at the edge of the shore. And we heard out in the darkness, we heard a guy say, I can't hold him any longer. I got to let go of him. And uh, come help me. And we turned around to try and swim, but we still had our boots on. But one of the guys had his boots off, come sailing by us. He swam out there. And the other fellow yelled, He's down here. He, he dove down and picked them up and pulled them in ashore, and then they uh, did uh, 
CPR on him, you know, the, mm -hmm. the back, with the medical officer watching and our captain, and then they declared him dead. He didn't make it. So they buried him near the tree line, and they said that he would be moved later on. Did he have one of those uh, white yeah, belts it, it, that it flipped him upside? It upside. failed. Oh. It wasn't a full vest type. It was just mm -hmm. that belt type. The other guy did, but his worked. Uh -huh. So then we got uh, with the Filipino guerrillas in the town of Mamboro. The next morning they had a... <clears throat> A bunch of, they had, we had a sea ration, but there was a cow, a carabao, uh, water buffalo, female, and they had milked it for milk, and they had a pitcher, and they wanted to want it, so a lot of us held out our canteens, and we were drinking, and it tasted quite a bit like cow, regular cow's milk. Mm -hmm. They said they had a little bit left, they said, uh, who wants it, and everybody yelled, gives it to the Boston boy. They called me the Boston boy. I wasn't from Boston, I was from Worcester, but... To them, anybody from Massachusetts was Boston. <laughs> so anyway, uh, we left that morning and it took us two days of travel, mm -hmm. of walking. It was quite a 20-mile hike. Uh, and that first day, we had a group, uh, a squad that was uh, leading, like a scout squad. They were about an hour in front of us. And we learned all later what took place. Uh, they were going along and they uh, heard some running up coming towards them. So they peeled off into the jungle on either side of the path. There was just one single path. And uh, down had come two Filipino boys. So our guys jumped up and stopped them and asked them, because they, they did speak English, if they uh, knew what, the, what was going on. They said, yeah, they were carrying equipment for the Japanese uh, patrol. And they didn't want to do it any longer. So when they got to the river, they took off. When they got to the other side, they were running down, going to the town of Mamboro. They asked them how far it was. They were behind them. They said they don't know, but probably a half hour. So our guys got down off the, that squad got down off the uh, path, and down come the Japanese squad. About there was about twelve guys, and uh, they opened up on them. They killed. Uh, uh, Nine of them. They, they, got, they said three got away. Mm -hmm. And uh, we come along and later on saw the dead ones on the side, on both sides there. And then uh, we crossed the river, which, by the way, had crocodiles in it. But they had guys on point shooting the river. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, next day we got near to the town and then we come in at nighttime. And the Filipino guerrillas had gone into the village and told the people to get out that we were coming in. So as we were coming into the village, we could see these people walk along, the women and children and older people, and they were staring at us and we were staring at them. Uh, we marched and we got around the village and they told us to, uh, Mike Matevich, our sergeant, said, uh, take a nap here. He says, we're going to wait till dawn. And I thought to myself, well, I'm not going to go to sleep from that close to the Japanese. Next thing I know, he was waking me up. <laughs> I fall asleep. And then uh, we moved into the village, and that's when the firefight took place. Mm -hmm. And it lasted uh, mostly to, from dawn till about three in the afternoon. They were in two block houses in the center of a, of a clearing, of a big, uh, like a, I don't know what you'd call it. It was, it was probably 75 yards of open ground all the way around those two mm -hmm. buildings. Plus they were in the foxholes. Did uh, your unit suffer any casualties? We lost uh, three killed and we lost 13 wounded, which mm -hmm. that was one of them. You were one of them? Mm -hmm. Where were you? Uh, were you hit with shrapnel or no, a bullet? No, I was shot. Where, whereabouts were you hit? To the left hip. How, how long uh, were you there before you were medevaced out? Well, it was about a, I was, I'd say it was about 1.30 in the afternoon when I, when I got shot. Mm -hmm. And it was a mistake of mine that I made. I made a big mistake and uh, it 
could have cost me my life, but it cost me the damage anyway. Mm -hmm. And then after I was wounded, they uh, moved us back to the other part of the village, and the Filipinos were women were making, they had killed a pig and they had killed a bunch of chickens and they were feeding us because we hadn't had any hot meals in a long time. Uh, I was in no mood to eat and neither were mm -hmm. any of the other wounded, I guess. And uh, we, uh, my sergeant could buy one how I was doing. I told him I was okay, but I said I, I wanted a cigarette real bad. And uh, I said, I don't have any. He said, I got some. And he, in a sea ration, you get a pack of four. He took a new pack out and gave me one, and then he put the other three in my pocket, and I'll bet they were his last ones. He said they weren't, mm -hmm. but he gave me those. Then he made me uh, uh, suck on a piece of pork because I didn't want to eat, and I mm -hmm. did that. So Then uh, they moved us to the beach, and uh, then they sent up two PT boats. And they uh, put us on board the PT boats and took us to uh, to 80 miles down the coast. Mm -hmm. Was it uh, like a field hospital or something? Yeah, second field hospital mm -hmm. in San Jose. How long were you there for? I was there, well, they operated on me right away. Mm -hmm. I was uh, there one week, and then they flew us by C-47 to the island of Leyte, 400 miles south. And I was put in a 44th general. I was there about a week or two weeks. And they put me on board the USHS, the United States hospital ship, Marigold. And they took us to uh, Hollandia. I was put in the 27th general hospital. Mm -hmm. I was there about three months. And then they put us on uh, uh, Late duty. They, they were out of the hospital, but not out of the hospital area. We were in tents. And I was there only, it was on the fifth day they put us on late duty. And we were to go out this day and tear down a mess hall. And I got out there and they told me to get up on the roof. We were knocking holes. I think it was asbestos. But anyway, we were tearing off the roof. And uh, me and one other fella, and the roof collapsed. And down we came. And I broke my ankle and my wrist. Oh my God! And they stuck me back in the hospital for two more months. So were, <clears throat> were you in the hospital when the war ended? No, I was put on LST uh, after five months, and uh, we were taken back to Leyte, and we were watching a movie. And uh, during the movie, the lights come on, and they said uh, the rumor that Japan has quit the war is ninety-nine percent true. Of course, everybody went crazy. That was mm -hmm. the end of the movie. We all ran, screaming back for the tent. And the ships out in the harbor were all uh, setting off their any aircraft guns and mm -hmm. jubilation. And uh, then from there, they told me I was going to drive a truck. I could either push a pencil or drive a truck. And uh, we went back to Luzon. And then uh, on New Year's Day of 46, we were put on on EPA, and I was shipped back to the States. Okay, and then you were you were discharged? I was sent back, no, I was flown back from Frisco to uh, uh, New York City, and then, uh, uh, correction, Richmond, Virginia, and then by train to New York City, and then uh, by train to Worcester, Mass. Mm -hmm. and were you still under medical care at that point, oh, no, or were you, no, no. you were all right? I was healed, yeah. Okay. Um, is, is it possible to stop this for a minute? Yeah. I want to go to the bathroom. Once uh, you were discharged and came back home, did you make use of the GI Bill at all? Oh, yeah. Uh, at first, I wanted that 5220 you were talking about. Yep. I was on that for uh, just a few weeks, and then, because uh, it, it was... Uh, yeah, there was kind of a waiting list to get jobs, mm -hmm. although they, they were doing a lot of hiring because everybody wanted cars, sure. refrigerators, everything after the war. But uh, one day I got a call and they said that uh, they didn't realize it, but I had been wounded in the war and I, for that I get preference on jobs. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. And so they said they were going to give me a job with the 
with the Pullman Standard Car Company in Worcester, Massachusetts, so I went to work for them. But they, uh, after three years, they kind of uh, collapsed. And uh, then I went to California with my wife and another couple. Uh, I went to the, under the GI Bill, I went to an aircraft school to become an aircraft mechanic. Oh. It was a, a one-year school. Uh-huh. And they gave us, uh, the way the GI Bill was, they'd give you $75 a month for a single guy, $105 a month for a married man, and uh, $150, I think it was, for a married man with children. Mm -hmm. I had one child. So you uh, completed the aviation course? I got my AE license, and I worked, went to work uh, right away because they the Korean War was starting up and they needed uh, guys and mm -hmm. I went right to, to a top A mechanic because of my license. Mm -hmm. I worked for Douglas. Uh, well, I did that when I was uh, going to school, but I had to quit because it was too too tough to try and learn and go to work yeah. too. Afterwards, I went to work for North America and I worked for them for, I don't know, nine months, something like that. And then I quit them and I went to work for Northrop Aircraft working on the F-89 mm -hmm. uh, jets, and it, I worked uh, for them. That was a great outfit. I liked Northrop, and I worked with them in uh, about three years, I guess it was. Maybe it was two years. And then uh, I heard they were taking tests for the United States Border Patrol. Mm -hmm. So I took the test in Los Angeles for that in April of 53 passed it and uh, notified that uh, to report to to Back Allen, Texas for the patrol. And that was my career, was the United States Port Patrol. And how did you end up in Whitehall? Well, at the station here. Oh, I see. But I was, you all started on the southern border. I started in Mission, Texas, Mac Allen, Texas, Rio Grande City, Texas, and now then I was, huh? Did you have to speak uh, Spanish? Oh yeah, they teach you Spanish in, uh -huh. in, uh, in Immigration National Law. Those are two main courses mm -hmm. you take. And then you have to pass after uh, uh, five months, you have a five months exam in both uh, Immigration Law and, and uh, also in Spanish. Mm -hmm. And you have three officers sit there and they question you in the, in the language. And then uh, at the 10 months exam, you, you have to be a year that you're on probation. The 10 months exam is the final exam. Mm -hmm. And then you have three high ranked officers. Uh, they, one of them plays a part of a, a, a quest, like a questionnaire. He has everything in English mm -hmm. and he asks it in Spanish. You have answers in English, but you have to translate it to Spanish. I see. So everything is orally is Spanish, everything written is in English. Mm -hmm. And you have the other two officers watch you and then they uh, rate you, your, how, you, how well you did. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I was there almost three years and then I transferred to North Dakota, to Pembroke, North Dakota. I was there almost four years and then uh, I uh, asked to come east, I wanted to get closer to home because my home was Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Well, my relative, my mother was here and my wife's family was here in Massachusetts. And uh, they told me I was going to Whitehall, New York. Mm -hmm. I knew, I heard of it being a backup unit. We weren't on the border, like as you can obviously tell. Yeah. But they, we were put in a position here that if, if anything got by Rouse's Point or Beecher Falls, we could cut over there and cut off the road. Mm -hmm. Plus, we had to check uh, buses, yeah. uh, trains on occasion, uh, cars, and of course, work information. Interesting. And then, when did when did you retire? The end of '77. Okay. And what have you been doing since then? Just uh, uh, enjoying life. Enjoying huh? life. I did drive a school bus for a while, uh -huh. about eight years, and. Uh, well, they needed bus drivers at that uh -huh. time, so I volunteered for it and helped me put my daughter through college. Uh 
Okay. So uh, eight years was enough. All right. I see we're down to about a minute and a half. Let me just ask you briefly. How do you think your time in the service changed or affected your life? Oh, you become an adult real mm -hmm. fast. Do you think you would have gone on to uh, uh, school schooling had it not been for the GI Bill? Oh, I doubt it. Mm -hmm. uh, true, the GI Bill was quite helpful. Mm -hmm. Okay, well thank you very much for your interview. Oh, oh yes. Okay, do you want to hold up uh, yes. your, your awards? That's the Bronze Star. Okay, and zoom right in on that. Okay, I got it. And you've got uh, your decorations. Uh, yeah, yeah, these are the paratrooper wings. These are the ones that actually were issued to me back in 44. If you can just tilt that forward just a little bit. Okay, yep. And this was the Bronze Star. My name's on the back of it. Okay. This was the Purple Heart. This is pinned on you when you're in a hospital. Mm -hmm. And then they, they just pin it on you and uh, congratulate you. And then, then they take it back and they mail it home. Because okay. you have no way of doing it. So that's my mother had it when I got home. And Asiac Pacific has the Philippine Liberation Medal and the Good Conduct Medal and other stuff like that. And that's this good. was a clipping my mother had. Showing okay. I was wounded. It was in a local paper. Okay, got it. All right, and we just ran out of film. It's perfect. <laughs> that was very good. Thank now, you, Wendell. We want to thank you.